Hello, I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director here at Long Now. Um, today we have a slightly different format for uh, our usual talks. We're actually going to be doing this as a conversation. I'm going to be welcoming Nathaniel Rich uh, at the occasion of his newest book called Second Nature. Uh, and I'm also going to be welcoming to interview him uh, Ryan Phelan, the Executive Director at Revive and Restore, and the lead scientist at Revive and Restore, Ben Novak. We're joining from three different locations and putting this conversation together um, the goal here is to is to not only talk about um, Second Nature, Nathaniel Rich's new book, but really as a kind of uh, an update on science that's been going on for quite some time in bringing back extinct species or designing new species to be better adapted for our current world. And uh, Revive and Restore was a project that was originally incubated here at Long Now. It was helped founded by uh, Stuart Brand, one of our founders. It's now spun off into its own nonprofit. But Nathaniel Rich has been studying this um, as a a journalist now for almost 10 years or more, and he has uh, brought together, I think, both the science that, that has been worked on at Revive and Restore, as well as some new science from around the world. And it's all together in this book and in this conversation for you today. Welcome, Nathaniel Rich. Thank you, Xander. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at The Interval um, after reading Nathaniel Rich's intriguing book called Second Nature, which is just out. Um, Nathaniel Rich, uh, you're calling in here from New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana. Great. Well, welcome. And we also have Ben Novak, um, my colleague here at Revive and Restore, our lead scientist. Ben? Hi, Ryan. Uh, greetings from North Carolina. And Nathaniel, it's great to be talking again. Well, Nathaniel, welcome to a Long Now talk. I'm here uh, in San Francisco at the Interval, and it's really a pleasure to get to interview you. Uh, in a sense, um, Ben Novak and I get to turn the tables on you. <laughs> Having been interviewed by you back in 2014 um, for your article in the New York Times Magazine, the mammoth cometh. Um, it was a major cover story for us. And, and I must say, uh, quite controversial at the time, because you really probed deep on something that was still very early on in its gestation, the bringing back of a passenger pigeon. Uh, we were delighted when we heard that you were actually um, going to include that article or an update on that article in your new book called Second Nature. It's really a thrill to, to be back with both of you, even if virtually the story that I, you know, reported so many years ago about Revive and Restore um, was so uh, foundational in my thinking for Second Nature. It was really in our conversations, my conversations with both of you, as well as with Stuart Brand, where I, I was first really given the language um, to articulate uh, some, some themes that had really been, um, you know, puzzling me, obsessing me, fascinating me for some time. And it was, it was really through the process of writing that story that I began to see a kind of larger, um, you know, landscape uh, unfold before me. And I found myself returning to this, uh, these same themes over and over again um, in the years since. And, and the results of that work, really the work of, of the last decade, um, is, is second nature. Well, since that time, you've interviewed an amazing cast of characters for this book. Um, and I must say, when I first started the book, it seemed like quite a disparate group of uh, interviews from talking to people who were involved in the oil and gas industry, uh, from Southern California uh, to Louisiana to uh, artists working uh, you know, with um, fluorescent green rabbits. Um, it's it's a, the full gamut. And it's been really interesting as one reads through it, connecting those dots in how we intervene in nature. Um, I'd love for you to talk us through a little bit about how you structured that that theme throughout of second nature. Yeah, so the the basic idea of the book and and the you know the basic problem I was trying to investigate is that you know there's nothing uh, natural about the natural world anymore. That anything that we describe uh, as nature or wilderness um, doesn't hold up under scrutiny to um, our, our definitions of those words. And, and you know, the, the, the basic idea is we've reconfigured um, every part of the planet from, the, you know, every cubic inch of soil to, to the atmosphere through our activities, sometimes uh, through neglect, sometimes through malice, 
um, sometimes in through some kind of misplaced virtue. And the the first the first section of the book is this realization that this has happened, which I think is a very you know disillusioning and unsettling idea that mm-hmm. that took a long time for me to really come to terms with personally. So the first stories in the book are about people who um, are in this, have a moment of, of personal crisis once they, they realize that the world as they, they thought it to be uh, doesn't, is no longer there or, or that, that their basic ideas about the natural world um, were a kind of myth. Uh, the second section of stories is about people who are navigating the, basically the weirdness or the, the uncanny quality of our reality today when we're living it in this time where um, there's so much unnatural about about our, our natural world. And, and the final section um, is about people who, like yourselves, who are trying um, as best as they can to use some of these incredibly powerful technologies um, that we've, we've, with which we've, you know, re-sculpted the, the planet um, and trying to use those same powers to restore um, what we've lost um, or to make the the world feel at least more natural, even if the idea of, of you know, natural is something of a, of a simulacrum. Well, I think for the long now audience, it's important to think about um, how this book relates to long-term thinking. And it's a really great example of uh, looking both at the history of many of these species and of what we saw as wilderness in the past to actually um, thinking through the social, cultural, and civilization aspect of it, especially when we get to Louisiana and all the devastation there and havoc that has been wrought. Um, I'm curious uh, if you want to add some flavor to that long arc of covering both wilderness and covering civilization. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the first insights one has when you start to look into this is that it's very hard to separate or impossible to separate, you know, human uh, beings and our society from the natural world, at least as long as we've been on the planet and we've been civilized. And I start the book with one of my favorite examples. I was once driving up the coast, Northern California, um, <clears throat> by the town of Fort Bragg, and it's, it's famous for this, this beautiful glass beach which is in a little cove off off the highway, um, and it's you know filled with pieces of sea glass. Um, and I I stop there like the thousand other tourists that stop there every day, and and walk down to the beach. and And I was told by some people there that oh you know this this beach used to be more um, more beautiful. There used to be a lot more sea glass, but all of these tourists are taking this the sea glass, and so it's sort of ruining the, this natural beauty of the of the beach, and they would use yeah. that term, natural beauty. And I said, thought that was really interesting. And I, I, I learned furthermore that there was an effort to bring more sea glass to the beach uh, to, to you know, revive its, its, its natural glory. And it was only after reading about it and thinking about it a little more that I realized what they were talking about, which is that the glass beach was the city dump. And it was, you know, the glass so is just, <laughs> it's just that it's just broken glass and, you know, Tupperware mm-hmm. and, and things like that from the 1940s and 50s um, that had been buffed and, you know, polished by the, by the surf um, over the years. And, and what, uh, and what people were, when people were talking about replenishing the glass, they were talking about dumping more trash essentially onto the beach. Um, and, and that to me is kind of the, Oh, oh, and then the, the final twist is that the leader of this effort, um, this local sea captain, retired sea captain who runs the Sea Glass Museum in Fort Bragg, um, he was appealing on an ecological basis right. to the state, saying that if your mission is really, as it says in the, you know, the charter, uh, to restore or protect natural beauty, then you should be protecting the glass beach because it fits your criteria in all these ways. And I thought, you know, he's on one level, he's so wrong. And on the other level, sort of right, you know, and, and that, that's where I, fi- I feel like that nexus, this kind of eerie tension between, you know, what's natural, what's unnatural, you know, when we talk about beautiful things, how much are we admiring ourselves versus admiring na- nature? Um, and how are these things in, enmeshed? And, and how do you detangle them? Um, I feel like we're this is very much the story of our of our time, mm-hmm. um, and in, in terms of, of long now, I mean, I also, you know, speaking with you all about 
you know, long, deep time and, 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 you know, enlarging one's framework on, on time and human history also helped clarify to me that I feel, I mean, you know, every generation thinks it's the most important generation in the history of the planet, but I do feel that right now we're on this fascinating precipice where, um, you know, we've already altered the world in so many ways, but we're only now starting to take responsibility for having done so, and only now beginning to think about, well, if we're going to be altering, you know, if, if, if it's inevitable that we're altering the world, you know, how can we do so responsibly? How can right. we do so ethically? And how, how can, can we, we do, do so? How can we do so beneficially? Beneficially, Instead of yeah. destructively. Instead right? of destructively, yeah. And, and in ways that are consistent with our, our, our highest values, you know, our better angels as opposed to um, are, 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 you know, the devils. And so that it does feel to me like we're on this tipping point and, and living in, in these, in this era, you see kind of, um, some, you know, you see glimpses of this, of a future, but you're also kind of mired in this, this past of exploitation mm -hmm. and destruction. Um, and so there's a kind of, uh, eeriness of, and, and a sense of, of, um, you know, a huge shift that's happening, um, that we're part of, um, but don't fully understand. And, and that to me is really the, the subject of, of the book. And it's really um, insightful the way that in each of these different chapters, you look at this shifting baseline challenge, whether it's uh, the trash on the beach that seems to have been historic for some people to the oyster fishermen there in Louisiana who feel like this has been a way of life forever. And yet, you know, it wasn't. Right. So the example you're talking about is one of the most <clears throat> fascinating uh, climate adaptation uh, projects, I guess you could call it, or, or um, mitigation mitigation project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, which is that though it's never talked about that way because it's in the state of Louisiana where um, nobody, no elected official, can use the word climate change out of fear of alienating sure. much of the the voter base. Um, to read these documents is like a fascinating um, display of double speak where. Um, the state bemoans the loss of the, the wetlands on the coast, which is our, our buffer against hurricanes and sea level rise. Yeah, I live in New Orleans, one of the, the cities most threatened by climate change um, in the world, at least in, certainly in the Western world. And um, our, our fate depends on um, having this robust barrier of, of marshland south of New Orleans and the southern coast of Louisiana. That marshland has been vanishing uh, for about a hundred years, um, for a few reasons, the the largest ones are um, the control of the Mississippi River, uh, preventing the river from flooding over time. So when it floods, it replenishes the soil, builds it up, um, and also the work of the oil and gas industry carving up the marsh to get to to oil wells. And so the state has this incredible fifty year plan, extremely. I mean, talk about long term planning. It's a 50 year plan, but it's perpetually renewing. So it always looks at the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. And the idea is quite literally to rebuild the coast. And the, the best way to do that is by altering the flow of the Mississippi River, um, basically opening up some control, controlled floods uh, through the Delta to recreate land. Um, and it has unanimous support in Louisiana uh, except for among the people whose, whose uh, lives and, and homes are most threatened by sea level rise, which are the people at the southernmost part of the river, um, who are terrified by this, this plan because they think that it will alter fishing conditions. Mm -hmm. And most of these people who live down there are fishermen. Um, and to a certain extent, they're right. It will change you know, what kind of species they'll be able to fish and and to some extent where they'll be able to live. Um, and yet it's the kind of uh, plan that is essential if the whole state is going to survive, including the part of, of the land where they live. And so for me, it's, it's a per this, this drama that's going on now, this fight between these poor fishermen and the state of Louisiana and basically everyone else in Louisiana is a perfect example of the kind of thorny moral questions mm -hmm. that are raised by even the most prudent um, efforts to intervene in, in some kind of natural devastation. Um, 
And so it did, it, uh, in, in thinking about our conversation today, I mean, it, it raised a question that I, I wanted to pose to both of you, which is that when you, you know, are there any examples in the work that you do in, in trying to bring back species, um, endangered species or extinct species, where, you know, you have a clear argument for why doing so would be beneficial, and yet, even in the best case scenario, it opens up some negative impacts for some small subset of, say, the people or some small part of an ecosystem. Uh, I'll let Ryan take that one away because I'll just answer quickly that, of course, um, in in the long now vein, what's amazing about our projects and you actually getting the chance to re-interview us and and I'll, I want to talk about that in in your about the book later. Um, is of course we have not gotten to a point where we have passenger pigeons or mammoths ready to go on the landscape. So a lot of people, um, even Fish and Wildlife Service a few years ago said, this is so theoretical right now, we're not going to really, you know, elevate it to concern. But every time a species is restored somewhere or there's a plan talked about these things, there's there's a subset of people who is, <laughs> whose lives are going to change. And it's always a, a concern to them, is it going to be a negative change, benign or neutral? But in one of our newer projects, since we first spoke back then, there's definitely uh, an economic sector that does not want change. And Ryan is very intimately familiar with that. One of the projects that has been uh, near and dear to us for the last three years at Revive and Restore is the um, trying to help save the horseshoe crab. Literally, um, you know, one of the oldest uh, species on the planet that has prevailed is almost identical to what it was as a fossil millions of years ago. And uh, every year it spawns along the eastern uh, coastline and its eggs and are used as an incredible resource to uh, migratory birds that, you know, it's a very, very important ecosystem um, occurrence. And I learned um, three or four years ago that the horseshoe crabs were actually bled um, by companies to use this very unique property, this protein in their blood that is a natural endotoxin detector. So it helps secure and has secured the safety of vaccines for literally um, 30 years now. Um, Before that, they used rabbits for testing. But the truth is, there's been a synthetic alternative, a recombinant DNA product that's identical to that protein that is so unique to the horseshoe crab blood. But there's a vested interest uh, in continuing to bleed these crabs that cost basically nothing because they're just a wild animal extract um, and to bring it to the pharmaceutical industry to make sure all our drugs and vaccines are safe. Um, That vested interest in doing business the old way um, has just kept this progress from happening in the level that it should. And luckily, the good news to the story is that Eli Lilly has been at the forefront as a pharmaceutical company, even now has a COVID-19 antibody treatment that has been moved all the way through production using the recombinant DNA product. So, you know, we're thrilled at that, but we need all pharmaceutical companies to be doing this, not just one. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't help but think of, I mean, there's a, there's a very close analog in, <clears throat> in, in one of the stories I wrote about in, in Second Nature, which is the, the, first, the first piece is about DuPont and this incredible mm. story of a lawyer <clears throat> uh, who is a, a defense lawyer for chemical companies in Cincinnati from a, a very conservative firm who, because of a family um, uh, association with his, his grandmother, um, he took on this, this case for a cattle farmer in West Virginia who thought that the local DuPont uh, company was poisoning his cattle. And nobody believed him. He was in this big DuPont town in West Virginia. <clears throat> and this lawyer uh, named Rob Ballot, using, um, because he knew these companies inside and out, because he defended chemical companies, um, over the course of you know years and ultimately decades, he was able to unravel this incredible, I think it's safe to say it's one of, if not the, the most, one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest, um, corporate conspiracies Mm -hmm. in in, in American history, which is that in the, in the manufacture of Teflon and other, you know, products that, that DuPont made billions of dollars off of a year in profit, 
um, they were using this man-made chemical called PFOA that doesn't biodegrade and that is a toxin and is now, years later, um, <clears throat> part of our biological inheritance. It's in, it's in all of our, our bloodstream um, because we've been exposed at such high levels over, over decades. Um, but the connection to the, to, to the crabs is that what he found at one point in his, in his research, and he read millions of pages of documents of internal memos from DuPont, is that uh, by the, I think it was by the early 90s, they'd been making this stuff for, since the 50s. By mm-hmm. the early 90s, uh, DuPont understood that this was poisonous, this was, this yeah. was toxic, and that um, people were, were dying and having all kinds of horrible health conditions who were exposed to it. And they had a replacement. They had what was seen as a benign, <clears throat> excuse me, a relatively benign replacement chemical that did the same thing, but broke down much more quickly. And so it didn't And they just in kept doing business as usual. I mean, it's outrageous. And, they, yeah, and the executive said, the, the health people were like, oh, we should definitely do this. And, and the business executive said, well, we're already on the hook for decades of this. If we get caught, as they ultimately Ugh. were by the lawyer, we're already culpable. Uh-uh. So we're not going to increase our culpability. And furthermore, if we change to this new unproven chemical, who knows, maybe the products won't be as good. And mm-hmm. that was enough. Just just the sort of fear of some slight alteration in their, um, in their business plan um, that might cost them some part of their you know, billion dollars a year profit. That was enough for them not to do the right thing. And It Mm -hmm. kept happening over and over as, you know, they got in more and more hot water, more the public began to get more aware of the issue. There were lots of off ramps and they never took one until they were forced. Um, And that's, uh, it does force you, you know, it's easy to say, oh, that's the evilest company in the world, which you you could say. Um, But it it does seem to get at something that that is um, uneradicable from our species it's a certain kind of way of thinking that if you if you allow people not to um, do the right thing too many of them often will not yeah well you definitely yeah. ha- have a theme going through your book of uh, of some of the downside of corporate uh, behavior that uh, is, is really sobering I have to say Robert uh, Balat um, it, it becomes a real hero in that chapter and I like the way you close saying that he now is representing uh, you know 230 million Americans uh, in his next lawsuit on behalf of of all Americans um, ensuring that they do the right thing yeah I mean he started as representing this cattle farmer and he's what then he was representing everybody in these communities in West Virginia. Now he's, he has a lawsuit on behalf of every American. And the only thing that's not stopping him from suing on behalf of every person and human and, and, and not only human, but, you know, biological mm-hmm. organism in the world, because the stuff has been found in the blood of, you know, albatrosses in the middle of the ocean um, is that is a, uh, you know, jurisdiction, but he's, he's taking mm-hmm. them as far as, as he can go. And, and, and Balad is, um, who you know has become a kind of national hero? He was, and he was the the story became a movie uh, called Dark Waters that I encourage everyone to see, where Mark Ruffalo plays uh, Balat. Um, but but he he's become for me he he was a kind of avatar for all of us in a certain sense, in that he had the kind of awakening moment where mm-hmm. everything that he thought to be true in his case, he thought that for instance corporations. Um, wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to to behave responsibly. That um, you know they wanted to follow regulations and so on. Um, was was false. And 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 furthermore, that you know the idea that we were all um, that we weren't affected by some of the, this malfeasance was also turned out to be false. And and he responds with this um, a level of anger. I think, and frustration and bitterness that mm-hmm. I think is, is an important part of, of how uh, a lot of us feel when we are forced to reckon with some of these, these realities. You know, the idea that what we think of as, you know, wild forests in North America, for instance, um, is such a degraded version of what they have been and what they could be um, that it, it, 
you know, I think anger, it, you know, a lot of the early stories in the book, I think when people are having this moment of reckoning, that's a common <laughs> response. I think that's, um, you know, I identify with that, a feeling of betrayal. Um, that, so, that what we've thought is not true anymore, yeah. Yeah, so the transformation that Blatt goes through as a corporate defense attorney now working on behalf of all Americans, in a sense, and all living organisms, um, is an interesting shift. And there's another hopeful one going on with people that are traditional conservationists. And you have a chapter in your book um, uh, where you refer to the, um, the the wasting, and it's about the sunflower sea star here all along our western coast of uh, California, all the way up to Alaska. Then in 2013, had an incredible uh, dieback from this wasting disease. It is still considered to have an unknown origin. Some assume it's climate change, acidification, an unknown pathogen. Um, and I, I thought it would be interesting to give you a little bit of an update from Revive and Restore because we're not just the de-extinction folks. Um, we also are very much about genetic rescue. And um, uh, two years ago, we started a catalyst science fund to fund researchers working at this bleeding edge of research bringing biotech to conservation. And we've been funding at the University of California at Merced two scientists um, Mike Dawson and um, uh, Lauren Shuttlebutt, um, who are working on the underlying genomics that are uh, potentially making sea stars um, more susceptible to this wasting syndrome. And I think this is the awakening that many conservationists have come to, which is that the oceans that they've been protecting um, are not the same as they were a decade ago, the coral, kelp, sea stars are going through major shifts and they're witnessing it in their own eyes as they go and dive and see a completely different now urchin barren um, and realizing that maybe they have to deploy new tools for conservation. You know, I think, I think in this entire conversation, uh, uh, we, we've kind of hit at what what you said, Nathaniel? This this very human condition. You know, we it's easy to target a corporation and say, oh, they looked the other way for a profit. But it really is innate in every human discipline that that we we so oftentimes have solutions to our problems for decades without using them because business as usual feels good. It's rewarding right now. And there's no crisis point. Even if it's slowly building up, we'll be like, oh, well, it's, it's slow, it's slow. And then all of a sudden you have a heat wave come through in 2013, wipes out more than 90% of the sea stars, and now we have to do something incre you know, very, very extreme about it, um, which needs new tools, right? So, I mean, conventional measures before might have been doing, if you had intervened before, conventional measures might have done something. And that's a... Um, that's a neat kind of thread between all of these with the horseshoe crab story where we've had a we've had a synthetic alternative for over 20 years that has barely been adopted um, in the in the DuPont story where they had a replacement but didn't adopt it all the way to the, the you know issues of the coastline in Louisiana Amsterdam and the Netherlands has been controlling the entire ocean for decades and we never adopted any of that in the United States. Um, that, that so many of these tools we need are right now, but we wait to the point of crisis and then mm -hmm. we need something new. And, uh, you know, I th I'm, I'm interested a little bit to hear Nathaniel's uh, uh, opinion on, on, you know, that phenomena. Because, of course, Revive and Restore, we're, we're, and we're pushing for those new tools, um, not just in response to crisis, but to use them as a management tool periodically so that we don't end up in more crises. And, and that is where we fit so nicely in long now because it's, it's, you have to be thinking in terms of long management, not just response to right now. Um, yeah. So, I, over to you. No, I think that's really well put, um, Ben. I mean, it, it was... Also, that was also the subject of my, my last book called Losing Earth, which is about this period in the 1980s where, 
you know, the consensus on climate change was crystallized. There was clear responses, um, policy responses that were understood and promoted, uh, and nothing ultimately ended up happening. And it was before you have the oil and gas industry emerging as this this comic book villain trying to squash any effect, any any effort um, at at climate policy. Um, you know, before before we had this this um, this arch enemy, uh, we failed on our on our own essentially. And it's about well, how did that happen? Why before the issue was politicized, why did we find it so hard to move forward? Um, and I think I mean the the conservation element of this that that's so central to the work at at Revive and Restore um, for me is really at the heart of a lot of of how I think about these issues and, and, and not just the work that you do, but these ideas of, of intervention and, you know, at what point do we start intervening or intervening more, um, purposefully, I should say, Mm -hmm. um, and, and how far should we take it and so on. And I, I was really struck, um, when I first met with, uh, with you all, I think it was a, a, a lunch I had with, with Ryan and, and, and Stuart, um, where I have it at my desk because I actually do keep it. This isn't just a prop. I keep it um, nearby. You gave me a copy of this book, Nature's Ghosts. Oh, great. By Mark uh-huh. Barra. It's good. Um, it's really good. And and it's it's a history of, of conservation, essentially, mm-hmm. um, conservation movement and, or the thinking that, that inspired it. And I was really struck by this idea of a marriage between the most futuristic technologies that uh, things like, you know, CRISPR and you know, genetic engineering to recreate or create new novel versions of, of lost species um, or to rescue endangered species. Um, and, and this, this uh, history of thought that really dates to the, the, is really the foundation of the environmental movement as we know it. Um, that goes back to, you know, 19th century um, thinkers like uh, you know Humboldt and 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 uh, George Perkins Marsh and so on, and and that was very surprising to me because it's not what I'd really seen in reading about you know um, the work that George Church was doing, for instance, that that you're involved with at at Harvard or you know some of the when you read about these futuristic technologies, they don't tend to talk about 19th century thought, but actually it made total sense to me that that one should first identify, you know, what we're trying to conserve, what we're trying to, to restore um, or bring back uh, before we start getting into the technology. And, and I was curious, I mean, I, it's something that I wanted to ask you further about. And as you've, you're now so much further into your work and you're doing all this, this great work with genetic rescue, um, you know, how much, how, how central is that kind of thinking in in your day to day work, as you as you make choices about you know what species to take on or you know where to um, focus your energies, um, how much do you think of these principles of of, of conservation? Um, you know, is that is that core to, to your decision making process as you as you move forward? Yeah, I mean, well, conservation is absolutely core to what we're doing. It's, that's why restore is part of our name. <clears throat> it's very much about ecological restoration. Um, <clears throat> the black-footed ferret is a really good example of a species that should have still be prevailing from Mexico to the Canadian border. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the black-footed ferret was, uh, as a project, was brought to us by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service saying, you know, can you help us with potentially a a, a, a bottleneck issue with the species that is all so closely related, having started with just seven founders when they were thought to be extinct. Um, we've recently just announced uh, the cloning of the first black-footed ferret, which is the first cloning of a native American endangered species. And um, we knew that, you know, going down this path three years ago would be controversial, but we're very pleased to say that um, the public and conservationists have taken it as, as a very serious um, conservation event that this is a milestone that endangered species could be cloned, could increase genetic variation, and really contribute to the sustainability 
of a species long term. Yeah, I think it's it's what's really cool about the reception we've had for cloning black-footed ferrets is everything we're talking about right now, you know, what you dawned on, this idea of marrying uh, uh, you know, this, this long-term historic context of conservation with the future technologies is that Elizabeth Ann the ferret literally embodies that as the fact that to bring new genetic diversity into her population today for the future, we had to reach into the past to do it. Um, and the only way to reach into that past was through biotechnology. You know, there's a lot going on, in, especially in the sciences, um, but also really in sort of ethics or, you know, on the vanguards of, vanguard of, of how we think about um, these major issues like uh, that, that, that you're involved, the kind of work that you're involved mm -hmm. in. Um, and it's often not until somebody writes about it um, or creates art about it uh, that mm -hmm. the public is able to really grapple with it in a serious way. Um, you know, the final, the final story in, in Second Nature is called Green Rabbit, and it's about this, this art scandal um, years ago where a Brazilian uh, Chicago artist named Eduardo Katz created this um, artwork that was a, a, a glow-in-the-dark, um, like, neon green bunny rabbit. And... It turned, uh, and people freaked out, and they said, you know, how dare you design a, a species for, you know, for art, for artistic um, response, and and uh, this is unethical, and so on. And mm -hmm. what he pointed out is that he hadn't actually done anything. He just, th you know, these rabbits were being created by French institutes to, to do research on vaccines and, and other things, and other kinds of, of human medicine. And it was only that, that, Cats brought it forward into the public glare um, that people fr freaked out. But as you know, he hadn't he hadn't created something new. He had he had reflected what was going on already. And I think that I think there's real value in that kind of work because I think most of us don't really who aren't in your sort of world of of you know on the on the on the front lines of this technological advancement don't really think ethically or morally uh, or even conceptually about some of these vast changes that are ongoing. And I think there's, there's a role there for writing and particular, particularly imaginative writing, not just pure reporting, but, but you know, immersive uh, narrative um, that allows us to really work through some of these, these major transformations that are ongoing. And, and I think it's, it's a necessary part frankly, of, our, you know, the cultural response to these, these, these issues and that, you know, we won't adapt these new technologies, many of which are hugely important for our, you know, survival um, until we're really able to think, think through them in a more profound way. Exactly. You know, um, I, I love that chapter for a number of reasons. One, um, Katz, uh, the artist you're referring to, says the function of art is to expose areas of life that we don't have the proper language to describe. And that uh, very often when a new problem emerges, it, it, experts in the field develop their own consensus on it, but it takes much longer for that technology to be actually adopted uh, by the public. But by the time it's already out there in the culture, the technology has moved ahead. There's this, there's this lag that happens. And I think that, um, you know, it certainly was the case with in vitro fertilization that uh, once it was out there, um, it moved very fast through the, through the society. And I suspect the same thing will be happening with precision editing. Uh, and well, yeah, we're, we're in, I believe, 2020, 2021 are the first years of human clinical trials for gene editing therapies, mm -hmm. just less than eight years, less than, less than 10 years after gene right. editing from CRISPR-Cas9 was actually harnessed. But not for heritable. Um, Correct changes. Yeah. So uh, that'll come, and that'll come well, it's, with it's, species it, first. Other species first. And that was an idea also that was in that that I, I first thought about um, thanks to one of our original conversations because I remember um, Ryan that you speaking about um, what you were doing not just as a you know science project or and not mm -hmm. just as a conservation project but as um, a kind of storytelling project. And I, I found that very fascinating that that it wasn't enough to to you know make your arguments about why a certain innovation should happen um, or to perfect the science you also had to 
bring the culture along with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that's really lost by by most people who who are who are doing the kind of work. Well, not that any, not a lot of people are doing exactly the kind of work that you're doing, but but on you know on the front lines of these these technological shifts, really don't stop to think about that or, or to think about it in any depth. And I think there's there's real value in that exercise. And I would say, in fact, it's it's necessary that we have to have these kinds of thought experiments. And for most people who might not understand, you know, CRISPR or, or you know, Cas9, uh, to think about, to think in those terms is, is actually valuable. And, and it's, it's a, you know, it's an example, again, that I think comes from conservation, um, where you have every, you know, every conservation group has as its mascot some cuddly animal. Um, and there's a reason for that. And I think it, it actually serves a, a purpose um, that, that one should take seriously. You know, what's really interesting there is, is, you know, you talked about your book being timeless. And, and as I read the last page, that all finally makes sense to me now because I read the last sentence and I was kind of like, it didn't end. I, I, I felt like it never there was, does. <laughs> I, was, I was like, did, and, and then Ryan and I talked a little bit about it and she was like, oh, well, and she kind of made me understand it a bit more. And my head was a little bit too much in the science um, and not enough in the art. And, and, you know, the, the guy talks about, you know, art lagging behind, you know, reality. Whereas we've done something kind of fundamentally different with de-extinction. We see it as an extension of things conservation has already been doing, but we're bringing in new tools and because we announced we wanted to do this before it was done, there's actually been a, like a wave of art and discussion and dialogue where the mascot is de-extinction and it hasn't been reality yet. I think we've done something really incredibly different. And in that line of, and that's where the storytelling is so important and, and why I'm really happy that your book is coming out with that one chapter about it embedded in this bigger context because the storytelling now becomes really, really imperative and a lot of people have been missing the conservation connection. And I'm going to weave something crazy for you right now, because here's how the storytelling has, has come back to something in your backyard. Is for years, people would ask things about, well, what are the unintended consequences of bringing back a passenger pigeon or a woolly mammoth? You know, Jurassic Park being the, the, the cultural motif that people fall back to. And... Even us, with our heads in conservation, couldn't say a lot about, well, how many times has it gone right? How old is this? And just in the last couple of years, we've started putting our heads together on the work we'd been amassing, and we published a, a paper on translocations. It's part of a bigger issue, special issue on a lot of things in conservation. But it turns out you know, that the idea of restoring a species in an area or saving it in one area for later, you know, the idea of moving animals around intentionally, this management, this thing that you hit on so much in your book about actually intervening with thought, goes way back. Um, and one of the first ones is in 1895 by Edward Avery McKillhenny. Uh, oh, yes with the snowy egrets on Avery Island. He moved snowy egrets, which were the rallying charismatic animal for the Audubon Society. And he moved them onto Avery Island and they took off, did really well. And it was actually that population that made it possible to restore and save snowy egrets in Florida. Um, and now today, 120 years later, Avery Island is threatened by climate change in Louisiana. And so it's like, it's the home of an intervention that was very proactive, helped save things, was very futuristic at the time. And now because of this weird slump back into every day as usual thinking, it needs more intervention to be saved. And I think, you know, it's, it's what's been beautiful in reading your book for me is learning just how much you really can interweave so many very disparate things into this common narrative. Well, the Avery, and also, I, I mean, for for viewers who don't have the association that is that I I, I have since childhood, Avery Island is where they make Tabasco hot sauce, and and McElhaney is the the family that that makes it. And I should say some of the some of his um, projects didn't work out as well. I mean, yeah. I think he helped bring the <laughs> the nutria, um, which is this just just disgusting um, <laughs> rodent. God bless it um, with yellow teeth that dis that is also one of the factors, uh, <laughs> a significant factor in um, the destruction of the marsh because it chews on the roots of marsh plants and and there are so many, they've so overbred that um, 
they have significantly weakened the the uh, the marsh uh, in South Louisiana. Um, but it it is it does raise another fascinating issue, which is that you know it it's not just it's not about restoring something that's lost. You have to pick, you know, where in the timeline you know you mm-hmm. want to to restore. There's a there's almost a sort of perversely curatorial quality of it. I mean, I think with the the sea stars, it, and correct me if this if the scientific understanding of this has advanced, um, Ryan and Ben, but. One of the one of my sources was saying, well, it may be that this ubiquity of of these beautiful sea stars along the Pacific coast that is now under threat because of wasting syndrome, that the ubiquity itself is a is a human phenomenon. That basically, because of human activities and and fishing activities along the Pacific coast in the twentieth century and nineteenth century, um, we've created conditions for this these species to overpopulate. And maybe now what's, you know, what seems like a total uh, devastating, um, you know, p- epidemic is actually a, rest- a restoring back to more natural levels of the species. No, I, don't I don't think know so. if that's, I don't no. buy it. No, I don't okay. buy it at all. No. Because now what we have are, are just total urchin barons. And it's really right. a crisis. No. You know, is what was, is the, you know, were the populations in, you know, 2010, was that the ideal population? Was it the populations in 1970? Was it the populations yeah, in 1920? Point. You know, fair point. And those are difficult conversations that, um, and I'm really, I'm not going to go out of my realm here, but Ben, I know there's some some question also about um, passenger pigeons and where where was that population? Um, you know, was that naturally in the flocks of billions and billions, or is that itself have you know? based on interactions with other species and human activities and so on. The population history of passenger pigeons was actually the missing hole in explaining their natural history. And that was actually the first significant surprise in our data. Um, we were not surprised that Europeans had not tampered with it, but a lot of people had come up with a bunch of different ideas. The most provocative, uh, popularized by Charles Mann, was that it, you know, after Europeans arrived in 1491 and brought disease, very poignant for right now, and wiped out the First Nations people that their population collapse allowed passenger pigeons to soar. Right. And that was an absolutely absurd idea that had no science behind it at the time even, but it became very popular. And, um, and we actually invented several hypotheses as to when passenger pigeon populations became large. And it was in the genetic data that they were all blown out of the water. And so it turned out that passenger pigeons had likely numbered in the billions for uh, before human beings ever even set foot on North American soil. Wow. Um, and, and so they've been a, a very stable, constant part of the environment, even while the environment changed climates and changed regimes. Um, and so that, that's, that's worth... That's true. Happy that to talk you, more there, but... Is that how you get to the, this idea of them being the, the um, architect of the, the yes, forest? Yeah. Yes, that was, that was actually, it was the one piece of data missing from completing that hypothesis that other I people see. had said, right? They're like, well, maybe their impact was beneficial and it was Got very it. important. When we looked at the forest, that was the other thing I saw, that when you look at even the trees, <laughs> the trees themselves, the other animals, they're all highly evolved for living in a system that's in constant flux. And their traits for doing that are traits that would have had to have accumulated tens of thousands, if not millions of years, over millions of years. Oh, that's um, and so it's, it's definitely not a recent phenomenon. And that's another reason that's, that's a, that story by itself is not, is not isolated to passenger pigeons. That's what more people are learning, of course. The way that we think about it is in terms of biodiversity and a healthy biodiversity. And so it's not as if there's necessarily a particular baseline that has to be met. But when when you know that you're losing sea stars, you're losing kelp. And you, if you lose the kelp, you lose the fish. And if you lose the fish, you, you know, it's just working their way right up. You know, it, it creates a cascade of problems. Same thing in Louisiana. Now you've got forests coming back. They're very different forests. But you've got birds coming back in some areas and you know it's it's going to create a greater biodiversity different than it once was but it's very different than the actual wasteland that parts of louisiana are experiencing so you know i think we're all learning right yeah <laughs> and I mean, it, you know what's really interesting there comes back to this idea um of of you know continually updating knowledge 
is that um, cr a, something that's not talked about a great deal in this science is the science of ecology is that even concept of baseline is is a difficult one because e every baseline before the year 1935 is theoretical. Right. Um, you know, ecology wasn't a science until the 30s, and the problem with it becoming a science in the 30s is it became a science in the United States. And in the 1930s, we hit our lowest forest points in history. We had already irrigated and destroyed wetlands. I mean, most of the ecosystems people were looking at in the 1930s were at their most impoverished point in the last mm -hmm. thousand years. Um, and so what's weird to me about dialogues about overpopulation and what we've heard from other scientists in this space is that we actually have been trained for decades to think of populations at the levels they were at their lowest point. And when they start coming back, we start fretting and thinking, oh, this is overpopulation, um, when it's actually not. Um, and so we have to go back to you know, a previous state and look at fossil records and, and now eDNA things coming out that could help with this and learn that um, it's really difficult to entangle. And of course, before Europeans, you have First Nations people managing the environment. But in general, I would say the last 500 years of European colonization of the world has, has devastated ecosystems and anything that has come back or started to rise up in that point in time um, is that bioabundance is a good thing over usually. <laughs> we should probably wrap it up. And um, I, I wanted to ask you one more question about the title of this book, Second Nature. Um, say a little bit more what you actually meant by that. That's a good question. Um, Second nature, I think, has to. I mean, there, there's a, there's a pun there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have this idea. It, it picks up on the idea that um, one takes what's familiar as for granted. You know that right. that conditions. I mean, Ben, you were talking about ecology uh, in the 1930s, taking for granted that this this fallen state of the the planet was the natural you know baseline. Um, I think we all do that in our own way. And so there's this idea that, you know, uh, the expression second nature, I think evokes one's, you know, taking for granted that this is just, this is, this is the natural world as we know it. Um, and any deviation from it um, mm -hmm. seems odd. Um, but, but what, what so many of these, the, the people I write about in, in the, in these stories encounter is that they realize that actually, you know, in order to get back to something that that does that is more natural that that is more biodiverse that is um, more ethical, mm -hmm. we actually have to deviate quite a lot from what we've been doing. Um, and so, you get to the idea of a second nature of a new a new relationship with nature that acknowledges that that difficult reality and acknowledges that. Um, what, you know, we have to think in a longer time frame. We have to think beyond just the immediate moment. We have to think both about, you know, the recent and distant past and, and the, the near and distant future. Um, and with that, I think, becomes a new understanding uh, of the natural world um, and understanding of a new kind of ecology, really. I think we're at, at the beginning of a new phase of, of ecological thinking uh, in this country that, that you know, organizations like like Revive and Restore are are sort of pushing pushing us to consider um, that intervention is not always a bad, and in fact, in many cases, it's it's necessary, and it's it's you know that that some sometimes these these what seem to be really radical departures uh, from the status quo are actually um, necessary to preserve. Mm -hmm. Um, what we want to, what, what we worry about having lost. Well, Long now always says we want to make long-term thinking automatic and common, not difficult and rare. And I think one of the things that Second Nature has done a really great job at pointing out is how important our thinking about the long-term is and how equally important is the short-term actionability. So thank you for bringing all this to the forefront in, in such an engaging way. Well, thank, thank you for your help in inspiring this. It, it, I really owe a lot to um, 
those early conversations that I had with you and, and, and from learning about the work that you're, you're doing was very um, central to the conception of this, this book. So I'm, I'm grateful to you oh, and, and grateful for this chance to talk with you both. Great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you, Long Now. Thank you.